Yes, we are all ready for the next day after a fantastic day yesterday. And today there will be different subjects being the newborn screening, which is really a subject which is discussed a lot. Although it exists, the subject itself exists already for a long time. Um, we will discuss emergencies by Professor Eugenio Mercuri and also neuropsychology in DMD and the use of psychopharmaca will be the last part of um, today, but also the last part of the whole conference. So to start with, we have uh, 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 Martina Cornell from the Amsterdam University, Professor of Community Genetics and Public Health Genomics of the Amsterdam University Medical Center. Um, so if it's okay, I will start the pre-recording of Professor Martina Cornell on newborn screening, the current policies and situation, uh, not just for Duchenne, but as a global perspective. Thank you for inviting me to speak on the uh, newborn screening. I will introduce the field and speak about current situation and uh, policies. My name is Martina Cornell and I work at Amsterdam University Medical Center. And they have a very strong interest in um, newborn screening, although not many conflicts of interest. I don't have any commercial relationships, but I am the chair of the Netherlands Program Committee on Neonatal Screening in which the physicians treating these children and the lab people and the people from the primary care who visit the families at home. All these people come together in that program committee. So I am chairing that. I'm also the vice chair of the VSOP, which is the umbrella organizations for patients and parents. And I have been the chair of the public and professional policy committee of the European Society of Human Genetics. So in these positions, I had different uh, interests as related to neonatal screening. And let me start introducing neonatal screening. First of all, we have to think about uh, screening as a public health intervention. Um, it's not just care, it is care for healthy children where uh, all newborn infants get the offer of neonatal screening, drawing a bit of blood as you see on the top and also checking hearing problems uh, as you see on the bottom. And the goal of the neonatal screening is to identify infants with conditions for which there is an effective therapy. And if that effective therapy can be started very early, it can prevent or ameliorate the disease so that these children live healthier and hopefully also uh, happier lives. Now, there are many conditions in neonatal screening programs that are genetic. Think of PKU, where you give a diet from very young age onwards, uh, avoiding especially proteins, or think of MCAT, where you uh, try to avoid fasting. So if a child gets very ill, you must give it um, uh, glucose uh, and at uh, certain times. But also you can think of hypothyroidism, which is often not genetic, and where you give medication. And in many other conditions, you also give either medication or diet or a combination of these. And what's important to realize for this conference is that neonatal screening is not the same in all countries, but there is a large diversity between jurisdictions. When I say jurisdictions, I often mean countries, but in some countries, the healthcare for one part is organized a bit different from the other part. Like in Belgium, the Flemish speaking Northern part has got a little bit different neonatal screening program than the French speaking Southern part. And if you think about the world, uh, then in many different parts of the world, the neonatal screening program is very different. This is a slide I kindly borrowed from the ISNS, the International Society for Newborn Screening. And you will see that in Europe, in Albania, we don't have neonatal screening, but in other countries we do. And the number of diseases included in the programs differ from two to 40. And in North America, uh, in the US, there is a recommended uniform screening panel for 35 conditions and another 26 conditions can be added kind of voluntary. So some of the states screen for more than 60 conditions nowadays. But also you see that in Africa, for instance, there is hardly any neonatal screening. There are some pilot projects um, for sickle cell disease and hypothyroidism again, but many of the African children are not screened. So different screening uh, opportunities in different countries, but also we have to think of neonatal screening not only as a test being offered, but as a program where first of all, parents get information and then there is communication, for instance, after the result of the screening uh, is clear, 
So they get either a good result or they get the information that something was not completely well and the child needs to go to a hospital. And sometimes it will have the condition uh, screened for, sometimes it will be a false positive, not being ill, but uh, just having a, a yeah, increased level of some kind of metabolite. Then there are ICT systems, which make it possible to collect all the data of the newborns, but also the results of the neonatal screening, and potentially also to combine that with the follow-up of the children after they have been identified and to check whether they all get good care. And what's important if you organize a neonatal screening is that also the test is reimbursed, so it's paid for, and the treatment is reimbursed, so also the treatment is uh, funded from healthcare or government. And the final point to think about when you organize neonatal screening is the governance. When you start screening for a few conditions, and you may want to add another one, who decides and what exactly is the process? Can parents also ask for a decision uh, on a disease being added? Uh, or is that uh, a health council that, for instance, looks at all the scientific evidence? And also this governance uh, is different in many countries. But all these countries tend to base their decision on what is screened for and what not on the Wilson and Jungner criteria. The screening principles uh, were already published in 1968 for the World Health Organization, and uh, they have been used for many screening programs, for instance, for uh, neonatal screening, but also for cancer screenings. And the first um, condition they mention is it should be an important health problem. And there they mention PKU as important because without the screening, uh, the children might get a severe developmental delay and with screening, they may go to primary school just like any other kid. So it is very important in their definition. Also, they say that the treatment should be available and a suitable test and that the resources used should be appropriate, which means if you compare it to other healthcare expenditure to funding for other healthcare, it should be kind of balanced. And if you summarize the Wilson and Juna criteria in just one line, the benefits should outweigh the disadvantages. Now, so far, I haven't said a lot about the disadvantages. So let's still think again about the benefits and disadvantages. And surely having an early diagnosis of a treatable disorder where you can avoid irreparable health damage and thus have a better prognosis for the children, that is clearly the main benefit. And if it's public health, it has to be for a limited amount of funding. Often we spend a lot for care for sick children or sick people and limited funding for care for still healthy persons. So the funding is often uh, less than 100 euros per child. And then this all takes place in a phase of life where false positives must be avoided. Think about a child that's just a few weeks old and the result of the neonatal screening comes and it has to go to a hospital. Of course, you only want that to happen if there really is something for the child to be added, to be um, gained. But also we don't want mild cases to be referred that would not need a treatment and we don't want uncertain findings. Preferably you would want children to be referred to the hospital only when they really have a positive result and need a treatment. Now, as I told you already, each country has its own procedure to evaluate the pros and cons. We have the screening criteria as a kind of a basis, but how they are really um, used is very different. And therefore the, the decisions made in many countries may also be different and the opportunities for infants in the European Union, but also globally may be very different. In the US, uh, 60 conditions may be screened for, and in Albania, none. So that's really a very big differences. Now in all those countries nowadays, often treatability is the central criterion. Is a treatment available uh, for which there is scientific evidence that the child will be better off if you start the treatment early? But patients and parents organizations often have said, we would prefer to have actionable diseases in terms of not only having a treatment, but also avoiding a long diagnostic quest, for instance, and or having reproduction, uh, reproductive options. And that's why Eurodis, the European Patient Organization, um, published uh, key principles for newborn screening in which they plea for many more conditions to be in the neonatal screening. Now, what do they mean by actionable? 
on the one hand, one action can, of course, be a treatment and thus avoiding irreparable health damage, but also it can be avoiding that long diagnostic odyssey that you will know as patient parents, because um, on average, the child is a few years old when you get the diagnosis of Duchenne, and it might have been much earlier. And if you already feel the child isn't performing very well, isn't developing completely normal, uh, you may want, uh, certainly in retrospect, an earlier diagnosis. Often also an early diagnosis would limit the number of unnecessary diagnostic procedures. Think of muscle biopsies. If you don't need them, why would you want to do them? It would also limit the uncertainty and unfavorable psychological effects. When you think of your son as a child that doesn't want to walk, that's uh, somehow um, a bit lazy, and suddenly it turns out that he wants to walk, but he has a problem with his muscles. Uh, also in psychological terms, you may um, yeah, well have a different parent-child relationship. Often um, actionable also refers to benefits for the family in terms of next pregnancies. If you know your first child has a genetic condition and there is an increased risk that the second child will have the same condition, then you may want to make different choices for the next pregnancy. And being informed here may imply that there will not be a second child with the same serious condition in the family or even uh, as a cousin. Uh, if your sister also wants to be pregnant quite soon, you may want to inform her as well. And finally, um, Eurodius also mentions benefit for society. When we speak about rare diseases, uh, we often don't know a lot yet, and screening may also, may also lead to opportunities for research. When you think a treatment might work, but you're not completely sure yet, then you might also consider to screen and have the children identified in a large research project, and therefore in a few years time you will be uh, able to evaluate the treatment much better. And finally, also cost is mentioned. Um, some children who are very ill may also lead to many healthcare costs and having an early diagnosis sometimes may lead to children being longer uh, healthy and not raising a lot of costs. Now I haven't spoken a lot about Duchenne yet, but also for Duchenne, there have been regional activities in the past um, and pilots sometimes or longer screening programs. Uh, for instance, in Wales and the United Kingdom, but also in other parts of the world. And often in these screening programs, CK has been used as a biomarker, which is not a very expensive uh, test. So the cost of such a screening is quite uh, low. And traditionally, uh, the late diagnosis of Duchenne can be avoided in this way. But in other countries, Duchenne has been uh, considered as an untreatable condition and therefore not eligible for newborn screening. Uh, in the Dutch um, Health Council report of just a few years ago, it is taken as the kind of typical example of an untreatable disorder. Uh, and also some of those pilots that um, were in the past um, uh, performed uh, stopped after a few years and the longest program in Wales stopped in 2011 after it had been in place for 21 years. And there they uh, mentioned that they were unable to support the accreditation. So the lab testing um, was somehow not possible anymore under the newer circumstances. But what we see in recent years is that there is a renewed interest and the next speakers uh, will show you why that is relevant for you as a uh, Duchenne community. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry that I am not present at the conference and will not be able to answer your questions, but you could always email me at mc.cornell at amsterdamuniversity.nl. Thank you. So although she's not live with us today, uh, we still could check and answer uh, questions later where maybe uh, Nikki or Norma uh, could an, um, answer some of them. But for now, we go to the next speaker, which is Professor Alessandra Fellini from uh, Ferrara. And she is the lead in the program on newborn screening called Screen for Care. And uh, Suzanne, maybe you can start the video. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to present uh, the Screen for Care innovative research approach uh, to accelerate rare disease diagnosis. I'm Alessandra Ferlini, I'm a medical geneticist and work uh, at the University of Ferrara in Italy. And I'm very pleased to, be, uh, to have been invited at this conference. Thank you so much. 
just a, a brief definition of a, a screening. So what is a screening test? It, it is important to understand that a screening test is not a diagnostics test. Why? Because a screening test detects potential health disorders or diseases in a population of individuals who do not have any disease do, or do not have any symptoms. So they are healthy uh, individuals. Uh, therefore, uh, if we translate this concept uh, into the new genetic newborn screening or newborn screening test, uh, newborn screening is a screening applied to a population, again, of asymptomatic infants at the neonatal age to detect genetic diseases. So the goal of the newborn screening are many, so early detection of a disease, early access to therapies and of course a disease prevention because we are uh, you know screening genetic disorders the, the story of newborn screening basically uh, uh, started in late 60s and it was based on the wilson and jungner criteria from 1968 for population-based newborn screening. These were, you know, a list of 10 criteria that are still used today. And on this criteria is based the ongoing metabolic newborn screening, which has, you know, occurs in many, many countries in Europe and worldwide. Uh, we are now in the 20th century, so we have many clues, many issues, uh, that are suggesting to revise the Jungner and Wilson criteria. Why? Because we have novel therapies for rare diseases, because now we have new tools as next generation sequencing, highly efficient uh, methods, uh, high throughput uh, strategies for genetic screening. Because we should go behind, behind the metabolic diseases, uh, of course, uh, metabolic screening or proteinomic screening is able only to pick up diseases where metabolites can be dosed in blood of infants. And then, of course, based on genetic newborn screening, many rare diseases can be, can be screened. But uh, at the same time, we have to be aware of the, the possible issues that we have to address. For example, false positive, which can generate anxiety in the parents, in the couple, expecting couples. False negatives that can impact on genetic screening accuracy. Unsolicited, uh, unsolicited findings uh, as variants of uncertain significance. VUS, which are very, very common and are very, very well known trouble for genetic uh, uh, definition. Ethical issues, uh, data ownership, because we have to keep in mind that we are going to screen healthy infants, so basically minors. And then there are a lot of ethical concerns or never mind ethical rules that we have to follow for genetic uh, testing, including genetic screening. Data ownership, so uh, the, the belonging of this genomic data to whom? So to, to the minor, to the infant, to the parents. There are many issues related to the ownership. Costs are also very important to be uh, evaluated because genetic screening, uh, in case it will be approved, should be offered to the entire neonatal population the turnaround time in Reaper, so the possibility to have a very rapid, quick report uh, about uh, the findings of the genetic newborn screening. So we know that we should revise uh, uh, um, Jungner and Wilson criteria, but at the same time, we, we know that there are many, many points, many, many issues we have to discuss in the community. This slide shows the very significant variations existing across countries in Europe for the offer of uh, uh, metabolic newborn screening. You see how heterogeneous is, is the number of diseases currently screened from Italy, which is the top, uh, the top recruiter with 49 diseases under screening now, 
uh, uh, till Romania, which is uh, only screening two diseases, such as Cyprus, and uh, of course with a very limited number of disease screening. This uh, uh, great heterogeneity, of course, is a, is a key point and uh, deserves attention for the future development of uh, newborn screening, also including genetic newborn screening. The Screen for Care is a project, is a European uh, um, funded project, uh, which is devoted to uh, shortening, shortening the path to rare disease diagnosis using newborn screening techniques, strategies and digital technologies. Uh, this is a project co-coordinated by myself, I'm very honored about that, and uh, by Nicola Garnier, so by Pfizer, um, which, who is the project leader. And this is why, because uh, uh, Screen for Care um, is a project uh, funded by the new basket of EU and IMI and FPA partners, so the IMI initiative of Innovative Medicine Initiative, where funding comes from both European Union and pharma companies. Overall, uh, the project has a budget of about 25 million uh, euros, involves uh, uh, 35 partners and 14 countries in Europe, is five years uh, running and started uh, the 1st October of 2020. The statement uh, 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 the Screen for Care is based on uh, is of course com comes from the rare disease uh, uh, contestum, so uh, conundrum. So, 30 million of persons living with rare diseases in Europe, 10% of them can receive a treatment. There is a major, is a major global health uh, challenge as recognized by the several uh, scheme, research scheme EU has proposed and funding and is going to fund in the future. And we have urgent issues uh, which are diagnostic delay for patients burden for this uh, diagnostic odyssey, so pilgrimages, uh, in order to get uh, the final diagnosis, and a patient society and health system costs related to the, these issues. So uh, basically poor access to treatments, uh, basically prime, primes up uh, uh, you know, a circle, uh, causing poor clinical outcome for patients, no screening and delayed diagnosis, difficult in, in getting the scheme, the ecosystem of rare diseases, and also research and development in, in, this, in this field. And then, of course, again, poor availability of uh, studies and uh, knowledge to, to get more treatments, more, to, to develop more, more drugs, more interventions for the rare disease patients. So the screen for care has uh, three main aims, pillar aims. So the, fir the, not the first and the third are mainly related to data collection. So federated the, the complex uh, rare diseases ecosystem in Europe. And the third uh, is we'll use digital technologies to improve the, uh, the to accelerate the rare disease patients diagnosis. So the project is based on uh, six interconnected work packages and many stakeholders, multidisciplinary boards, patients, organization uh, are involved in the project. The governance is complicated as you know, very uh, typical of EU projects, but it's robust because it's composed by the executive committee and by uh, we have an ethical, legal and safety team, the scientific advisory board, the innovation board and the patient's advisory board. And all these boards are, uh, you know, interlinked, interrelated in various steps and various tasks of the, the screen for care. We have six work packages, as you see on the left, the work package one, which is uh, uh, focused on understanding the business and the regulatory framework of, uh, of rare disease, uh, uh, newborn screening in Europe. The number two, which is the data set, the data repository of screen for care, federated metadata repository, including machine learning uh, tools for rare diseases. 
The word packet three uh, I'm going to present in a while is focused on newborn screening. The word packet four is based on electronic health records uh, and to develop and repurpose uh, machine learning based algorithms uh, to detect patients uh, at risk for ray diseases. The word package five will design new tools based on digital uh, apps uh, to track and to uh, you know monitor the ray disease uh, the, the ray disease uh, phenotype in during the disease course and the number six is of course project management and dissemination. So we have Eurordis as a partner of Screen for Care. Uh, that's very important because this ensures that we have the voice of patients, uh, uh, you know, co-design and co-creating our project uh, and uh, through active uh, participation to different tasks in the various work packages, including one, work package three for newborn screening and work package five. Uh, the work package three of uh, screen for care uh, objectives and tasks are listed in this slide. So we have uh, five different uh, uh, tasks. Uh, the preference studies, so stakeholder preference assessment, uh, that will be a larger survey that we will, uh, uh, you know, ad um, adopt in order to understand which are the preferences from couples, expecting couples and parents uh, for the genetic dubo screening. Then we will develop a, a dedicated gene panel for treatable diseases, so genetic newborn screening for treatable diseases. And uh, similarly, we will develop a dedicated panel or approach for actionable diseases. These two tasks are coordinated by the Bambino Gesù in Rome and Eurordis. Then we have the task where we will run in the in real life newborn screening in our infants in different countries and we uh, we plan to run and uh, to run about 20,000 infants in Europe and so UNIFES or myself will coordinate uh, this task and then we have a series of uh, uh, you know uh, tasks related to post diagnosis planning and recommendation to offer all genome sequencing for early symptomatic cases and to assess uh, to what extent newborn screening and its follow-up will empower exposed families. That would be very important in terms of output of our, our study in this work package. And then uh, uh, at, the, at the end, we will evaluate the evidence on cons effectiveness for genetic newborn screening in our selected ray diseases. And uh, this is the consortium, uh, newborn screening, uh, as, you, as I said before, uh, is composed by uh, 35 different partners. You see here many companies com coming from FPA and also academics from several universities uh, in Europe. So we are uh, a full integrated private-public partnership uh, aligned, you know, in order to uh, to have uh, to achieve our our objectives uh, uh, at the end of the project. Uh, screen for care is committed to maximize collaboration uh, to avoid application of effort and participate to international cooperation on genetic newborn screening. This is why we were we are happy to be part of the ICONS consortium, so international consortium of newborn sequencing which is based and was funded by BabySec directors, so Robert Green in the United States, but now so many other initiatives are on board, Genomics England, Begin NGS, Screen for Care as well. That's very important for us because one consortium to unite a growing international movement, this is our, our motto and we do believe that uh, cooperation and collaboration will be vital in order to promote uh, genetic newborn screening uh, and to make it use uh, very well appreciated and understandable in the uh, health uh, communities in various countries. So thank you for listening. You can follow up Screen for Care on the website and Twitter, so, uh, social media. And of course, for any questions, my, our emails, you may contact myself and Nicola and Screen for Care. Uh, at UNIFE, uh, at University of Ferrara. Thank you very much.
Well, then a big thank you to uh, Professor Ferlini. And then the next session uh, will be about the pilot in ongoing pilot and then uh, in uh, New York. And two speakers are Nikki Armstrong, Associate VP, Community Research and Genetic Services from PPMD, and um, Norma Tavagoli, a research scientist, Wordsworth Center, New York State Department of Health. So um, I think you will continue after one another. So please go uh, ahead. Floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I'm going to start off by just by giving a little bit of background about newborn screening in the United States and how the New York State pilot came to be. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tabacoli to talk through more of the details of the pilot. And then I'll finish up with just kind of where newborn screening for Duchenne is in the United States right now. So, assuming my slides will cooperate, here we go. So uh, newborn screening in the United States is a state-based program, which means that each of the 50 states gets to independently decide which conditions to screen for. Uh, the map shown here is showing the darker states are screening for more conditions, lighter states are screening for fewer conditions. Each state also gets to decide how to add new conditions to the screening panel and how to actually screen for those conditions in that state. So what methods they use, what algorithm they use, whether they do two screens for every baby or one screen for every baby. So each state makes its own decisions. That being said, the federal government does have a list of disorders that it recommends every state screen for. And that is the recommended uniform screening panel, or as we fondly call it here, the RUSP. And the RUSP is not a mandate, it is just a recommendation for the states to screen for. In order for a condition to be on this recommended uniform screening panel, it must be nominated and go for, through a detailed review process. Uh, that process includes a committee that has experts in newborn screening, clinicians, ethicists, folks in data analysis, uh, that all review the, the condition. And they're, they're looking for many different pieces of evidence, but sort of some of the key pieces are that there must be benefit to screening for that disorder to the baby. So direct benefit to the baby, it can't just be benefit to the whole family. There also must be available effective treatments for that condition. And then lastly, you must show that you can screen for that condition. And that the way that that has to happen is that there must be a prospective pilot that identifies at least one baby with that condition. And that pilot needs to use a screening method that you would expect uh, other states to use. And so that's actually one of the, the reasons that the New York State pilot came to be. Uh, there have been many newborn screening programs for Duchenne in the past. Most of them have used creatine kinase or CK. Uh, but the development of the CKMM assay meant that there needed to be an additional pilot, and it also needed to be a large pilot and in a diverse population. And so those, those factors are the pieces that led to the development of the New York State pilot. This is a not at all to scale timeline of the development of the pilot and sort of the process so far. Uh, what you can see is that, that it took about uh, four years from the time that the first conversations about the pilot were initiated to when the pilot actually started. It was a monumental effort and one of uh, PPMD's largest initiatives to date. Uh, it involved uh, so many different people, including uh, industry, uh, New York State Department of Health, uh, two major hospital systems within New York, as well as a steering committee that is full of experts in Duchenne and in newborn screening as a whole. So it, it was a huge effort. Uh, the pilot's been screened for two years, and in just a minute, that Dr. Tavacoli will talk you through that process. Uh, as that screening was underway, we started working on the recommended uniform screening panel nomination package, which was then submitted last summer uh, and is uh, still in review, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but right now, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Tavacoli to talk you through the pilot. Thank you, Nikki, and um, also thank you for the previous speakers for giving a good outline about newborn screening in general and newborn screening for Duchenne uh, in the past. So today I'm going to talk about a consented pilot study that we did in New York State to screen newborns for Duchenne. Next slide, please. Um, the pilot study was funded by Sarepta Therapeutics, PTC Therapeutics, Solid Biosciences, Wave Life Sciences, Pfizer, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, and Protein Alma. And I have no conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. 
Um, so in New York State, uh, the, the newborn screening programs screens all newborns for over 50 different disorders. We have approximately 208,000 newborns born in New York State each year. And in addition to uh, testing for the 50 different disorders, we also perform pilot studies. So for example, for Pompeii, Fabre, Gaucher, and Pneumothic, and MPS1. And as Nikki mentioned, in October of 2019, we took a consortium approach to perform a two-year pilot study to screen newborns for Duchenne. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows you the screening strategy that we took. So when specimens arrive in New York State, we test them for the different diseases, but at the same time, any specimen that was consented for Duchenne, we also tested for CKMM. Um, the kit is um, produced by Verity or Perkinelma. It measures the um, concentration of protein kinase MM in dried blood spots. Um, so if anything was below the cutoff, we considered a screen negative. If anything was within our borderline cutoff, then it was considered borderline and we'd request a repeat specimen be sent to us and we'd retest it. And then if it was above our referral cutoff, we would refer the baby to a specialty care center where they would draw blood or collect a saliva specimen and send it for next-gen sequencing for the DMD gene and deletion duplication analysis. And if that was negative, they would send it for sequencing for next-gen sequencing in, of a neuromuscular panel. And then they would report the results to the newborn screening program and the speciality care center. And in March of 2021, um, there was a lab in New York State that was um, became authorized to test dried blood spots um, for Duchenne. And at that point, we were able to do the screening using uh, dried blood spots rather than collect a second blood or saliva specimen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows you the specimens that we screened over the two year um, period of the pilot. We tested approximately 40,000 specimens from approximately 37,000 babies. 51% were male, 49% were female. Um, most of the specimens, so 90%, were collected between 24 and 47 hours of age, but we also had approximately 4% specimens collected at less than 24 hours of age, and then approximately 6% after 48 hours of age, and these are usually repeat specimens. Um, we had approximately 7% of our babies were low birth weight, 87% um, were normal birth weight, 6% were high birth weight, we had eight specimens where the quantity was not sufficient, so we had to request a repeat. And we also had 331 specimens that were considered suboptimal. So although we test those, we also ask for a repeat. Next slide, please. Um, so when we did the validation, we realized that um, CKMM is influenced by various factors. Um, so this slide shows you on the left that um, the age of collection makes a big difference to CKMM values and therefore we set our cutoffs based on age of collection. So you can see that the, the highest level of CKMM is, is when the specimen is collected between 0 and 47 hours. And then after 168 hours, um, CKMM values are quite low. Um, we also um, detected a slight difference between males and females. So males have a slightly higher mean and median CKMM, but for us it wasn't sufficient for us to determine a different cutoff for males and females. Um, we also have noticed different CKMM values based on um, gestational age and um, birth weight. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows you, unfortunately, it's not showing the red spots that were positive for some reason, but um, there are four spots that were in red, uh, which were our positives. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, our referral cutoff. Um, so at 72 hour, hours of age, uh, our cutoff was 4,000 um, nanograms per mil. And then if the specimen was collected at greater than 168 hours, our referral cutoff was much lower. It was 571 nanograms per mil. Um, and based on this, we were able to catch some babies that, where the specimen was collected later and the CKMM level was lower. Next slide, please. Um, so we had 296 babies who had borderline results. That's one in 124 babies. We requested a repeat for these babies. 60% um, of them were male, 40% were female. 
the age of collection ranged from one hour to 101 hours. Um, one, approximately 1% 1 of the babies were low birth weight, 88.5% were normal birth weight babies, and 11% were high birth weight babies. And the CKMM values for these babies ranged from 644 to approximately 4,000 nanograms per mil. Next slide, please. Of the 296 babies who had borderline results, we received repeats for 277. Um, we had one baby boy who had two borderline result, results and then the third result, and so it was reported as um, normal. Um, a baby girl had two borderline results also and the third result, so that baby was also normal. Um, we had two babies who had an initial borderline result, but on a subsequent specimen they were referred. Um, one was a female DMD carrier and one was a male who had a deletion in exon 51 of the DMD gene. Um, CKMM values normalized in 275 of the babies who had initial borderline results. Um, 17 families dec declined repeat testing, and one of the mothers of, um, of those families um, was a DMD, known DMD carrier. Um, we had two families who were lost to follow up, so we weren't able to get a repeat. Next slide, please. Um, we had 42 infants who were referred, that's one in 876 babies. 60% um, were male, 40% were female. The age of collection ranged from one hour to 3,360 hours. 7% um, of these babies were low birth weight, 81% were normal birth weight, and 12% were high birth weight. And the CKMM values for these babies ranged from approximately 1,000 to over 18,000 nanograms per mil. Next slide, please. Um, so when we followed these babies up and the second tier testing, molecular testing was performed for these babies, we found four um, who had um, were confirmed with DMD or BMD, Becker muscular dystrophy, and one was a male with a duplication of exon 18, one had a de deletion of exons 48 to 49, one had a deletion of exons 3 to 43, and one male had a deletion of exon 51. Um, we also found a carrier um, who was a female with a stop codon in exon 63. Um, we also found carriers of other muscular dystrophies because as I told you, we also did a neuromuscular panel. Um, so there were two babies who were carriers of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, two male babies with, who were carriers of llama 2 muscular dystrophy. One male baby was a carrier of muscular dystrophy, dystrophy um, other disorders that we detected was one female baby who was diagnosed with allergy or syndrome. This is unconnected with elevated CKMM. We had one male baby who had a possible inborn error of metabolism and another male baby who had cerebral palsy and neuromuscular respiratory weakness. Um, we detected um, variants of uncertain significance in genes of the neuromuscular panel in 22 babies. Um, in 15 of 19 babies where CKMM or CK was remeasured, we found that um, in 15 of those babies, um, the value had normalized. Um, in four babies, the CKMM remained elevated, and this is still unknown. Next slide, please. Um, we also found that there was birth trauma in various babies who had elevated CKMM. So 10 newborns had shoulder dystocia, two newborns had mutual cord complication, um, two newborns had hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and seizures, and eight of the newborns were breech. And we already know that birth trauma at birth um, leads to elevated CKMM, and there's markedly elevated levels of CKMM following vaginal delivery, especially if it's complicated by forceps, vacuum, and breech presentation. Um, we had a, um, a number of families who declined or were lost to follow up. Um, so two families could not be reached. Six families declined genetic testing. Four families declined the neuromuscular panel after there were no pathogenic variants detected in the DMD gene. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows you the turnaround time for results. Um, so we had four babies, baby 5, 6, 15, and 22, who, had, who were confirmed with DMD or BMD. And um, the, from birth to referral, it took between 7 and 64 days. Um, and then our carrier was uh, referred on day 146. Um, and this, the 
delay was mainly due to them having an initial borderline result and then um, a second specimen was requested and then that uh, specimen was a referral. And baby 15 was a bit different in that this baby was not consented at birth, but um, because her, uh, the baby of the mother had um, was a carrier, this baby was consented later. And so we referred this baby at 64 days of age. Um, and then the genetic testing usually took approximately three weeks at an outside lab. Uh, but by the time specimen, the baby was seen and a specimen was collected, that took some additional days. Um, so in total, the turnaround time for um, Diagnosing the babies was between 41 and 238 days. Next slide, please. Um, so in conclusion, we took a consortium approach to perform a pilot study in New York State. Um, we validated a first year assay for the detection of uh, Duchenne. Um, there were nine hospitals in the New York City area who participated in this pilot study. And during the two year pilot study, um, we um, screened approximately 37,000 babies. We've referred 42 babies for follow-up. Um, four of these babies are consistent with the diagnosis of DMD or BMD, and our incidence is approximately one in 6,000 males. Um, we also found six carriers of various forms of muscular dystrophy, including a female carrier of DMD. Um, 12 of the babies, so 29% of referred babies, had traumatic birth. Um, we have collected data on screened, borderline, and referred infants. And um, we've also performed some surveys of uh, families who had borderline and referred um, babies to understand their input into the study. And uh, we are using the data from the pilot study to nominate DND to the recommended uniform screening panel that Nikki mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to thank all the people who were involved. This was a very large study and many people were involved. Uh, Dr. Michelle Kajana is the PI for the pilot. Sanju, Brianne, and Melissa, research scientists in my lab who performed all the testing. I'd like to thank the DMD steering committee, uh, obviously Nikki Armstrong from PPMD, Drs. Gruber and Chung from the various hospitals, um, Annie Kennedy, Dr. Perian Brower from uh, ACMG, all of our funders, um, all of the recruiters and newborn screening staff at the hospitals and the newborn screening program, and obviously all the families who participated in this pilot study, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I pass it on to Nikki. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tavacoli. Uh, so after the completion of this um, very important pilot, we did pull together all of the data that was that came from that pilot and submitted for the recommended uniform screening panel. Uh, we're still in that review process. Uh, this is a slide that shows kind of the details of how that process works. Uh, we're in the, the section that's called nomination and prioritization review uh, with hopes to be on the agenda and voted on in August. This is a, a committee that meets quarterly. So we're hoping to be on the agenda in August uh, with a yes vote there, we would move into evidence review, which is the more kind of detailed review of uh, newborn screening for that condition, uh, with an end goal of hope, hopefully being added to the recommended uniform screening panel in 2024. And as far as what's happening in newborn screening for Duchenne in the United States, uh, right now there are two programs ongoing. The first is a consented pilot study in North Carolina, it's the RCI Early Check Program. Uh, the second is an opt-in supplemental screening program. It's not considered a pilot, but it is uh, opt-in at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and then we have multiple states right now that are considering universal newborn screening for Duchenne in that state. Uh, we have some states that are reviewing it. Uh, their newborn screening advisory panels are reviewing it. And we also have some states that have legislation underway. Uh, so Duchenne newborn screening is still in early stages in the United States. But we certainly have hopes that uh, the number of babies screened for Duchenne are going to increase significantly in the near future. And I do want to also thank you for your attention today and then thank everyone uh, that, that Dr. Tavacoli already thanked and Dr. Tavacoli herself for all of her efforts on this pilot, um, but our steering committee, our funding consortium, and the work group members, and of course, all of the families. So thank you. I would like to uh, thank you both for this uh, really wonderful presentation about the experience you had in New York with this pilot. And we are looking forward, of course, to all the 
things you will write down and we can learn from as well, because this, I think this is really an important thing to share with other people as well. So at this moment, I am going to look at the questions and answers, but probably you're so clear that there were no uh, questions. There are no questions uh, uh, for you unless somebody is still asking for it, but I don't, I don't see it. And I, I think uh, what might be nice that in a lot of countries you see that families, um, patient organizations are trying to get approval to do at least a pilot. I mean, the nationwide thing is the next step, of course, what everybody wants, but first to do the pilot. Did you have a lot of trouble getting permission for the pilot? Dr. Tavakoli, do you want to? Um, so we had an over approximately 90% uptake for the pilot, and I have to remind you that we did it during COVID, so it was a very difficult time, and the numbers did drop during COVID, and one of the reasons was because the, um, the people who were consenting the patients weren't allowed in the hospitals, um, so we had to move from an in-person recruitment to a remote recruitment. So we had to do it by phone and by email. Um, so it, it became a little bit more difficult, but in general, I would say 90%, over 90%, it was a very good update. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and then the other question was then if like ethics committees were difficult to even give approval to get started with a newborn screening for Duchenne, was that the easy one? I think because it was a fully consented research pilot and we did use institutions that were familiar with doing newborn screening pilots in the past. Uh, so we, we were able to work with, I mean, the New York State Lab does a number of newborn screening pilots and then the hospital systems we were working with had done similar pilots in the past. And so that actually wasn't a huge hurdle. Uh, I actually think one of the biggest hurdles is funding. Uh, it's very expensive to run that consensus pilot. Uh, it requires a lot of manpower to go and consent the families to participate, and then the actual you know, the laboratory pieces and the, the tracking the samples to make sure that only consented samples receive the testing. Like all those pieces are, are complicated and expensive. Do you have additional pieces you would add there, Dr. Tavakoli? No, I think I agree with you. It's uh, the one of the main reasons um, our numbers, what we were hoping would be higher is because it's so expensive trying to get a recruiter at every single hospital that we, you know, we had to work with. It's, it becomes very expensive to do a pilot. If it, was, if it wasn't consented, that would be a different story. We also had multilingual recruiters because we were trying to get a very diverse sample. And so the different hospital systems had recruiters speaking out different languages to try to get very diverse samples. So it was, it was intense. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like a lot of intense work. And then was it uh, the follow-up program for the families? Was it hard to get money for that? Was it that an easy uh, part because we know sometimes in studies like this, you know, everybody's interested in newborn screening, but then you have the diagnosis and then maybe you can elaborate a little bit on, on that one as well, how difficult that was to get it up and running and who's responsible for it. It's a great question. Uh, this particular pilot actually didn't have a huge follow-up piece to it uh, beyond the, the surveying the, the families and uh, interviews with the families to get their perspectives on it. Uh, after the babies were diagnosed, they were transitioned to clinical care. So they went to um, multidisciplinary muscular dystrophy clinics in the institutions that we were partnered with and were followed through clinical care. Uh, there have been pilots in the past where there was a research branch where babies went directly into a particular protocol, a research protocol. That was not true with this pilot. Um, the North Carolina pilot does have a, a sort of a piece of that that's following uh, those babies using a, a physical therapy and um, early interventional services model. So I think that's going to be really interesting data that came out of there. But it, it, as you said, it's really expensive to follow these, these children long term uh, to, to be able to provide the data of the benefits of that early diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Both of you. Thank you. And also, of course, the speakers who are not now uh, online. And then we go into a break. Again, thank you so much. And the, we will reconvene at 20 minutes past four. And that is then Central European uh, summertime. So that is 23 minutes from now. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.
All right, welcome back everyone. Hope everyone had a lovely coffee break. Let's move on to the second session of today for the Duchenne Care Conference, which is all about emergencies. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Mm. Yes, the next chapter is indeed emergency care in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a topic which was discussed recently also at a meeting in Rome. And we are very happy that Professor Mercuri from the Gemelli Hospital is there uh, from Rome. Uh, we, we will, as we did uh, the first day, just refer to the standards of care. We showed the first day that the standards of care are in uh, three Lancet articles. And for the emergency, there was a separate paper in the pediatrics. And I think that is kind of the basis on which we now build on our uh, stories, our information. Everything we tell now is not instead of what was known before, but on top of what was known before. So um, I'm very happy this is the paper, but also based on this first paper in 2018, we uh, set up a video and animation for families to really understand what are the things they have to do when it comes to emergency care, how they can make sure that they do the best they can in such situations. So um, maybe Susie Ann, you can start the video. Emergencies happen to everyone. If you have an emergency and need to go to the emergency room, there are some special things that people with Duchenne need to do. Take your emergency card with you. This will let you and the emergency room staff know what to look out for. If you have a smartphone, there is also an app that you can download that has all of the emergency information on it. If you use a cough assist machine or breathing machines at home, take them with you to the emergency room. Take all of your medications with you to the emergency room. You must call your neuromuscular specialist and let them know that you have had an emergency. They can also work with the emergency room doctors to make sure that you receive the right treatment. Also call your heart or pulmonary doctors if you are having a heart or breathing emergency. If you take steroids every day, let the doctor know that you must not go more than 24 hours without taking steroids. If oxygen is needed, your carbon dioxide should be measured in the air that you breathe out or in your blood. Giving oxygen without measuring your carbon dioxide is very risky in Duchenne. If you have a fractured bone or had a bump that may have caused a fracture, tell the doctor that you are at risk of fat embolism syndrome or FES. In Duchenne, the bones have some fat inside. When a bone breaks, pieces of the fat are released and may get into the bloodstream. If the fat then travels to brain, lungs or heart, it can cause FES, which can be life-threatening. If you have a fracture or a bump that could maybe cause a fracture, you should watch out for signs of FES. These include difficulty breathing, pain in your chest or head and a change in your behaviour like confusion, dizziness or not acting like yourself. If any of these signs are noticed, go immediately to the emergency room. This is an emergency. Take the information from the internet about FES and tell the medical staff that you suspect FES. So now after this video, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor McCurry, and we are really interested to hear from you uh, about this important subject. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, and I will. So I think the video did a, a fantastic job in putting in a very lay language things which are extremely important. And uh, um, even if the standards of care have been uh, uh, around for many, many years now, and uh, some of these uh, concepts have been uh, explained uh, uh, very nicely and, and, and very importantly to uh, the associations of pediatricians, intensivists, and so on, it's still amazing the number of uh, Duchenne boys and and uh, young adults uh, who um, who um, arrive to uh, an, an emergency room uh, uh, unprepared and uh, what is even worse is that the world is unprepared to receive them so uh, even in countries like Italy where you would expect that the level of uh, information is uh, 
um, is, is very high, um, we still have a, a, a lot of uh, um, 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 casualties related to mis mismanagement. So what I will do today, uh, um, and the, 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 the slide, the, the, the file has just been sent, is to go through some of the aspects that have been highlighted in the video, but also to highlight uh, this uh, new concept of emergency. Some are related to aspects which are relatively new, which are due to increased survival, and some others uh, are related to uh, the um, some aspects which are coming up at the time when new therapies are becoming available. We do see some new aspects of emergency that uh, we were not aware of and, and, and so on. So I will discuss this. And uh, uh, as uh, the video was showing and Elizabeth was showing in introduction, um, the, um, the, the stance of, of care have really been a dividing line because uh, um, not only they have a uh, um, made the standards of care for physicians, uh, but uh, they have also, thank you, uh, thank you, Suzanne, um, uh, but, uh, um, but they have also um, uh, highlighted some aspects. Now, this, these aspects of acute care are more relevant in older boys and adults who are more vulnerable and uh, with increasing uh, number of years, uh, of course, there is more risk of having uh, more cardiac and respiratory problem, uh, but uh, theoretically they should be established to all ages uh, uh, and some aspects are not necessarily age related. Uh, um, and uh, um, the, the possibility also of infections and other aspects requiring hospitalization uh, have to be taken into account every time the child or the, the, the young adult goes to hospital. The next one, please. So um, I think the, uh, what the video was highlighting is uh, uh, that uh, you need a plan of action. You know, there is the need for a plan of action, which starts from uh, having an emergency card. We will see this in a moment, but the video was showing very nicely. And, uh, uh, and uh, what we always say is that this plan should be discussed between the doctor and the, the family or the, 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 the boy or the young adults, why they are well. It's not something that has to be established at the time when there is an emergency, because this always happens at night, during weekends, uh, or the time when uh, uh, the emergency puts so much pressure that one is not thinking really straight. So this thing should be done in peace at the time when everyone is, is well uh, and, uh, and should be done. The ne next one, please. And uh, uh, the video was already showing about, uh, you, you can call them emergency cards. I'm sure that in different countries, this is called in different way. But what is the, the concept is that you need an emergency health plan, which starts from uh, what you should have at home, when are the situations when, when you require intervention, what you should bring with you. You know, I, I was very impressed with uh, how easily the video was explaining, bring your own medication, bring your own ventilator. It's a... Uh, um, uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's still a bit depressing that uh, when family forget to bring the ventilator, many hospitals are not equipped to have a ventilator to sustain and they just put children on oxygen back because that's the only thing, the thing they can do. So this emergency healthcare plan is extremely uh, important. This should be written together with the med medical team and should cover all the information that you have seen uh, and in, in the video. Um, and uh, uh, it's also important that uh, uh, families uh, uh, and together with the help of the physician take a, a, a good look at what is available locally because uh, there are times when uh, one cannot afford to travel for, for, for a long distance and, and uh, uh, children or young adults should be referred immediately to the uh, nearest facility and other time where the local facilities have really nothing to offer and, uh, and it's just a waste of time because uh, after an assessment, they should be transferred anyway to another assessment. So the local hospital should be uh, um, um, asked whether they, they can care for young boys or, or adults with, uh, you know, with, with the needs um, uh, that, uh, that are known uh, because of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the plan should be made also uh, a written plan so that when the ambulance comes, they know which is the point where they have to be transferred. 
and uh, what the video was also showing very nicely was that uh, healthcare providers should be contacted in case of an emergency. It's very, very important. You know, uh, we we deal with Duchenne uh, every day of our lives, and for us, is is an extremely familiar uh, disease, but uh, uh, is is still a, a rare disease, and not all the doctors in all the hospital are aware uh, of uh, Duchenne or of the management of Duchenne. So, so contacting the tertiary care, the healthcare provider, which is usually the pediatric neurologist or the neurologist for the adults, or the pneumologist or the cardiologist, depending on uh, the severity of impairment of the individual person, is absolutely important because this will help to establish a connection with the local hospital if this, is not, this has not happened. The next one, please. And uh, Elizabeth has mentioned that there have been several attempts to describe this uh, in the in the in the in the care recommendations. This is the last version of of the care recommendations. But as Elizabeth was showing, there are also other papers who have described in details this uh, this uh, next one. And uh, uh, we should go in in order. Next one, please. And uh, uh, we, we we can uh, we start from the home setting. You know, it's it's very important and in the healthcare plan, the home setting with the intervention strategies about air gray clearance, ventilation, nutrition, hydration, needs for antibiotics for, for, an, for, a, for an infection and so on, are all established at the time when they are not needed. And uh, um, also, uh, it should be discussed what are the criteria of the thresholds for presentation to an emergency care. The, the, during the COVID, we have learned uh, uh, how important it is uh, to avoid to go to hospital unless this is needed. So establishing this criteria and the thresholds uh, and the communication with uh, with uh, with uh, with um, uh, with the healthcare provider uh, is uh, um, is a major point. Now, last time we discussed this in Rome in February with uh, um, family representatives, uh, there was a lot of anger and frustration that uh, healthcare professionals are not always available to take the call and. Uh, uh, and it was highlighted the need for having a sort of 24-7 uh, contact number that uh, would establish uh, some contact in case of an emergency. So this is an important point where we as doctors can improve in our own practice to provide uh, um, the, the people who are followed by us in our center with some contact numbers that will work also on, uh, uh, on, on weekends or on nights and, and, and so on. The next one, please. <coughs> And these are just examples of what is on the standards of care. Um, and, you know, th there are things which are uh, very important on whether there are restrictions or resuscitation. Some, some, uh, some, uh, some boys, or especially if uh, when they go, uh, um, in, when when they get a bit older, they may have uh, some posturing, some scoliosis. They may, they may, they may that may. Uh, could make uh, um, um, an intubation more difficult. All these things should be known uh, in, uh, um, in advance. Uh, and uh, one important point that we were also seeing when we discussed endocrine is the chronic steroid therapy for different, for dif for different reasons. Uh, one being that the children need to take steroids continuously. The second is that we may be dealing with, uh, with some aspects related to uh, the steroids. And so it's very important that... Uh, 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 the um, the doctor is aware of uh, the, whether the patient is treated with chronic steroid therapy and so on. And again, in this different list, you can see there are some points which are recurrent, like contact the patient's neuromuscular sp special. And so when, when we, we talk, you know, as, as doctors, we have really have to make sure that the neuromuscular specialist is there to take the call, is uh, to, 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 to reply this. Next one, please. And... Uh, um, what is really important is, is the home equipment. Many local hospitals are not equipped with non-invasive ventilation, and uh, uh, the, um, the, the, um, the video was also um, showing in, with a simple line that uh, if oxygen is given, because there is uh, some uh, uh, low oxygen levels and there is concern that there may not be oxygen, this is possible to give, but uh, um, while we normally... Uh, prefer to give non-invasive ventilation. If oxygen is needed, it's extremely important that the blood gas analysis is performed because uh, uh, normally in neuromuscular disorders, uh, the exchange between oxygen and CO2 uh, is uh, 
uh, let's say, highlighted by the low oxygen. And if we just provide oxygen and we do not improve uh, the exchange with the non-invasive ventilation, we, we may indeed uh, increase the oxygen that uh, will also produce uh, some uh, um, effect on the breathing centers. You know, if the breathing center feel there is enough oxygen, they will uh, they will reduce the struggling to get the exchange going, and this will in, in, results in an increase, a very increased CO two, which can be extremely dangerous. So, uh, very important to have uh, uh, the non invasive ventilation that uh, that uh, the, the especially if this is used at home, and to perform blood gas analysis. And the next one, we will go very briefly to this. Uh, Cardiac symptoms, of course, are very important. We do know that now that we are uh, so successful with non-invasive ventilation in the last two decades, uh, cardiac problems are still uh, the main issue. We know about ventricular dilatation. We know about uh, heart rate and rhythm. And uh, so it's it's extremely important that a cardiologist who knows about Duchenne is, is, is involved. And the next one, I will go through quickly through this because these are known things. And uh, the, the stress steroid dosing um, may be necessary. And uh, it's, it's very important that uh, uh, the clinicians are aware of the possibility of a critical, critical adrenal insufficiency and they, know, and they know how to treat it. And uh, even if uh, as standards of care, more and more centers are now providing to instructions to the families that uh, if this happens, family know how to deal with this. But this is not always uh, uh, available in all centers, in all in all boys and in all families, and uh, not always the centers know about the protocols and and so on. Next one, please. And uh, um, we, we the one thing that we will um, reiterate in, the, in in a couple of slides is, is the fat embolism syn syndrome. Uh, if there has been a fracture, we, because this is a, a very um, frequent. Uh, um, but we will we will discuss about this in a few slides again. Next one. So the, these are the sort of emergency that have been highlighted in the standards of care and uh, um, that we expect. You know, we all know about something very acute occurring in the cardiorespiratory issue or the adrenal suppression and so on. But uh, uh, there has been an increasing evidence and an increasing concern about uh, with with uh, the boys becoming young adults and living much longer. There has been extremely concern also on other aspects which have been less highlighted by the care recommendations uh, and uh, where there is less evidence uh, not only of their presence, how frequent they are, but also how to treat them. And this can be quite severe. And gastrointestinal dysfunction is something that is often underestimated severe constipation, which could bring to fecaloma and to uh, severe acute events are something which are often underestimated. We, we are still not uh, really, you know, and I know there are a few surveys and other studies going on and, and others have, have been just performed, but this is really something where we should need more on how frequently they are and also to provide some recommendations because many centers uh, really know very little on how uh, to deal with, uh, with, with, with these aspects. The next one, please. And uh, in, in general, uh, the, the attention over, over the last five years maybe is uh, since the last standards of care were published is that uh, uh, while we feel we are quite well covered in terms of recommendation for cardiac and respiratory failure, still the message that uh, cardiac and respiratory, especially cardiological emergency, are extremely frequent, but that they are not the only cause of uh, uh, death is still not uh, completely known. I, I just put this paper as an example because uh, they had a very nice cohort. This is relatively recent. And they show that uh, one in five patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, dies from causes that are not related to cardiac and, 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 and respiratory. And uh, the next one. Uh, and um, um, and uh, uh, the, the the stroke is is one of them, uh, but the gastrointestinal complication. Sorry, the the uh, the the, bu the bulleting is has, has gone wrong. The 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 embolism and uh, and um, and um, and the gastrointestinal complications are uh, frequent, and uh, therefore we really should pay more attention in identifying uh, what are uh, 
the, the, the precautions which, which we could take, how do not arrive to have a gastrointestinal complication that becomes so severe that can lead uh, to uh, intensive care or, or, or to death. Uh, and the same apply to embolism. Uh, particular attention should be paid in patients who have fractures or um, in, in, in my personal experience, sometimes even um, procedures which are a bit stressful for, for the child. You know, I have been witnessing uh, some, uh, um, um, you know, in children who are in pain uh, for, um, in, in, for, for, for orthopedic problems and so on, some procedures even uh, can, can, can cause uh, um, vagal dysfunction and, and sometimes uh, they, they can produce uh, very acute events that they are difficult. To do. So the, the concept that we are dealing with, uh, with, with fragile uh, people who need more attention also in, in everyday care has to has to go through a bit more than that. And uh, um, one thing that uh, people should be aware is that when the, the one in five in whom the cause is not non-cardiopulmonary, uh, this generally occur at the younger age, uh, slightly younger age than the cardiorespiratory issues. So, um, the next one, please. Um, the last part of my talk, because I see that the time is also running, is that uh, um, other than the new emergency that uh, you know have become a bit more obvious after the care recommendations were were published, are these uh, new new emergencies? Because now we are dealing with an increasing number of uh, boys and young adults who are uh, undergoing clinical trials, especially with. Uh, new therapies, uh, there, there are a lot of phase one studies. Uh, um, uh, phase one, uh, for the ones who don't know it, means that uh, these are first in humans. So the extent uh, uh, of safety uh, issues is, is really not uh, um, yet very well established, even if there are animal studies. And uh, of course, if, if, uh, um, if a study arrives to a phase one, there are already some indications that the drug is safe, but the phase one is really about testing safety in a larger cohort and, and for the first time in human, but also in the trials which have uh, uh, gone over the phase one and they are in phase two or phase three, there are still a lot of things that uh, are potentially dangerous. And uh, it's very important that the, the clinicians uh, uh, are um, are aware of, of, of these things and not, not only the one who are running clinical trials, but also the one who, have, who are following uh, um, boys and young adults who are maybe do, uh, doing uh, uh, experimental therapies in other sites. Uh, and I think the recent death following the CRISPR therapy has scared uh, many people. Uh, and even if there has been uh, um, recent uh, um, further information on the possibility that this may be due to the virus, the, the, to the CRISPR procedure, this is, this is probably putting the field uh, uh, a bit more on hold that we would like because we 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 appreciate that uh, we have to be careful in monitoring this uh, this adverse reaction and uh, um, the community knows that how that uh, we also had uh, adverse re reaction following gene replacement therapy uh, that uh, are undergoing several clinical studies and the next one please and uh, these are some slides which I borrowed from, from Professor Montoni that uh, uh, are a summary of what happened in uh, five children who were not in uh, two, uh, one clinical trials, but they were running different clinical trials with different molecules and different uh, vectors uh, and still had uh, some elements in common. These five children who were all uh, in an age range, which was the, the age range which was um, suitable for, for the clinical trials. They all had been those with uh, some mini or micro dystrophin uh, um, with, a, with an AAV vector. Uh, and uh, these were uh, belonging to three different clinical trials. So we had three molecule, three different molecules and also different vectors in, in, in one case. And uh, these children had uh, some very similar events, uh, and uh, um, the, the symptom onset was at the end of the first month, approximately at the time when they were um, uh, when they were reducing the steroids, but also at the time when we expect some microdystrophin or mini-dystrophin expression. The next one, again. And uh, 
uh, the, 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 the events were very scary because uh, um, there was uh, not only loss of ambulation, these children require uh, intensive care. Um, they, they lost practically all movements, movements. They were completely paralyzed, including the respiratory muscle. Uh, and uh, in some cases, there was a severe myocarditis with a severe heart involvement uh, and inflammation, which was uh, uh, very long in time and the very severe respiratory in, in, in in, insufficiency. Um, this, these cases have been uh, treated with uh, either by increasing steroids with bolus of steroids or using other immunosuppressants like tacrolimus uh, or plasmapheresis. Uh, and uh, eventually they all improved, but this was, this was all very scared. And now we know, next one, why this happened, or we think we know why this happened. The next slide, uh, uh, Suzanne, sorry. Uh, and uh, we know that the children were sharing uh, the same uh, um, um, the, 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 the same mutation, or at least the, the mutation in some exons uh, uh, that are relatively rare uh, deletions in the N-terminal region of, of Duchenne, uh, of the Duchenne gene. And this has uh, an overlap to the, to the transgene sequence that was present in the constructs uh, that, uh, that were, that, 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 that were administ administered as part of the therapy. So this overlap uh, made that uh, the mini dystrophin was recognized as non-self, uh, and, uh, and uh, so there was a massive immune response which caused all this trouble. So now this is not to scare you because we hope that we have understood this, but uh, next one, just to make the point uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, the advent of the new therapies is highlighting that there are new area, areas of, uh, of possible um, uh, emergency, and uh, um, we, we should be prepared. Uh, um, and uh, the centers, or the centers, not only the centers who are performing uh, the, the gene therapy, but also the ones who are following children who are part of gene therapy programs, uh, should be aware. And as we discussed at the beginning, that uh, uh, that uh, these things should be discussed at the time when things are fine, whatever, when, when the children are well. Uh, at the beginning of a new therapy, everyone, including the local doctor, should be made uh, aware of what are the possible adverse reaction following uh, gene therapy or any other therapy. I'm just giving the example of gene therapy now because this is where we had more problems recently, but this will apply to all the clinical trials. And it's very important that a multidisciplinary team is informed because uh, what we have in clinical practice is that we may have uh, the best immunologist in the world or the best uh, nephrologist in the world, but uh, when it comes to new therapies, experimental therapies, viruses, uh, uh, vector vir viral, vi viral vectors, and, and so on, these people will say, I have no specific experience with that. And if they don't know the protocol and other, um, they will not be in the position to help us uh, when something acute is happening. So it's extremely important that we make uh, the teams in the hospital where we work and the local teams aware of the possible adverse reaction, also in order to recognize uh, minimal initial signs that can make a lot of difference. In the cases you have seen shown before, this all started with minimal signs that deteriorated very rapidly within 12 hours. If the children had not been seen because they were in hospital for assessment at the time, I'm not sure they would have survived. So it's extremely important to raise awareness. I, I mean, I, I don't want to scare anyone, but uh, I think uh, it's extremely important that we raise awareness of the possible adverse events and that we are ready to treat them with protocols which are decided when the children are well, and hopefully we'll, we will never use. And uh, on top of the major adverse events that very luckily are extremely rare, so, you know, the, 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 these were extremely rare, it was an extremely rare situation for an extremely rare uh, group of mutations. There are, however, other concerns that if the gene therapy would become will become available, and we hope that the FDA and and subsequently also other regulators will accept them. We know from experience with other gene therapy like SMA that uh, once the these therapies are commercially available, the the families may not always be compliant with the monitoring. And we know how important the monitoring is because uh, relatively minor adverse events that uh, if they are identified it immediately can be very easily managed with increasing steroids or, or very easy procedure, if not monitored carefully, 
uh, they can become much worse with time and produce uh, um, much more severe adverse events. We have the experience with SMA, with uh, three children who received gene therapy, then dis they disappear from the monitoring and they, they died uh, uh, from liver failure because this had not been monitored as it should have been. You know, if, if we identify minor events when they start, uh, they are very easy to treat. So this concept that uh, we have to prevent emergency by raising awareness with the families and the doctors of the importance of monitoring is very important. And I think I am going to my, my last slide. And uh, the conclusion is that uh, the concept of emergency in Duchenne is changing uh, with increased survival and with the advent of the new therapies. Uh, and uh, uh, we really need uh, to still do some work on uh, uh, some aspects like GI, um, um, uh, GI complications and GI adverse events that we see more and more frequently and raise more awareness uh, on possible causes of emergency not related to cardiorespiratory. And the, the new frontier is really uh, hoping that these new therapies will become available soon, not to be afraid of them, but to make sure that if we know them and we know uh, what are the possible adverse events, uh, we will be in a very good position to treat them properly in time and uh, to avoid severe adverse events. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, highlighting that, especially with the new therapies, uh, a multidisciplinary team should be involved before the therapies are administered to, to make them more, more, more aware. So this is a jump in the future, probably, but we do hope that this is not a, a very a future very, very far away from us. You know, we do hope that these things will become available soon. And, and, and I think this is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, really impressive presentation on the topic, which, as we all know, is to family is very important, but also clinicians. I think everybody wants to avoid emergency or handle them properly, but indeed the plan is often not uh, in place. So thank you so much. We have now time for questions, but I think you are so clear there are no questions from the audience. Uh, I see, I give them one minute to ask a question if they like or, it. Or I was so boring and everyone is asleep. <laughs> they went for a coffee. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, no, it's still there. So I think with this, then we, we can uh, uh, stop the emergency uh, part. Thank you so much again. And we will make the recordings available. So also people who want to show it to their colleagues can do this in the near uh, future. And that the, also other centers in their country can uh, can be aware of this. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank and that you, you did this you. all thank on you. a very uh, busy day. Thank you so much. And then I'm waiting for Suzanne. I think she's sharing her screen, but maybe to look for the slides for the next speaker. Suzanne, is that what you're doing? Currently, Philippe is sharing his slide, but I think what I want to say is in the chat, we got a comment from Iga that says we are not asleep and it's a very inspiring lecture. <laughs> That's good to know. So then the next speaker is still yours first, right? Yeah. So uh, the next uh, uh, session is about neuropsychology in DMD, also at the moment of the Lancet paper in 2018. Not so much was known and you don't find so much in that Lancet paper. Meanwhile, the world has kept turning and there's a lot of new ways to approach neuropsychology to uh, new uh, data, new treatments. So um, we have two speakers now, both from the Netherlands. One is uh, Dr. Jos Hendriksen, to a lot of people well known from other presentations. He's a clinical neuropsychologist from Kempenhagen. And uh, Dr. Philippe Collin, the, about the use of psychopharmaca in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is also a topic that deserves more attention than it had so far. So, um, Dr. Hendriksen, you go first. Yes. Okay. Thank you for. Thank you, for <laughs> thank you very much for introducing. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak on this topic. I will uh, start up. Let's see whether I can share my screen. Um, I will be talking about behavior and learning in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. My name is Jos Hendrikse. Philippe Collin is the psychiatrist who will uh, take over in uh, 15 minutes from me. In the next slide, you see our center. We are part of the Center of Neurological Learning Disabilities in the southern part of the Netherlands. 
and our team, you can see in the next slide. So we can go on quickly on this, where you see that we are a multidisciplinary team with a child neurologist, a child psychologist, and a child psychiatrist. And we have some PhD students. The next slide shows that we have no financial interest to declare. And then in the next slide, you can see what it is all about. It is about the psychology of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It was a booklet we published in 2010 with Duchenne Parent. It is now translated in five languages. And it is actually uh, outdated because we are now 13 years later and we know, we know a lot more about the psychology of Duchenne. As you can see in the next slide, where you see what happens if you search on the web of science on the uh, search words learning behavior and cognition, then you can see that from 2010 onwards, there is a much higher incidence of publication. So it's an increase of interest. And we know that this is a major concern for parents. So there is a growing interest in uh, the psychology and the psychological aspects. The next slide shows our uh, topics we have, we will be discussing in the next uh, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, I will shortly discuss a little bit about standards of care, and then we go to brain involvement, psychosocial adjustment, neurocognitive functioning, and then in the final two parts, there, it's about neuropsychiatry and about psychopharmacology in uh, um, comorbidities of uh, Duchenne. The next slide is just a slide to show quickly uh, what it is about when we talk about the standards of care. You probably know this slide, it is 2018. And I show in the slide next to this one, what is about uh, routine mental screening. It is advised that there is a mental health screening and four instruments are uh, uh, suggested to be used. Um, you can read in the standards of care, and these are the instruments that are available and that have been normed for boys with Duchenne. The next slide is what is it that what it is about neuropsychological evaluation. It's just a short advice that evaluation should be done when there are cognitive delays and, uh, and they should be done every two or three years to monitor the development and to see how the boy develops. But it's not saying how this care or how this evaluation should take place. And I will discuss a little bit with this uh, on this with you later on. And the next slide is then uh, on the medication to treat. And uh, there are also the standards of care need an update because we now know that there are uh, that there are some evidence-based protocols to be used in medication to treat behavioral or emotional disorders. So the standards of care, uh, they say it's necessary, but uh, they do not say yet how it should be uh, addressed, all those topics. When you look at the next slide, for instance, we did a review on the literature that was published between 1982 and 2019 on uh, questionnaires being used in Duchenne population. And what we found is an abundance of questionnaire. We found 45 studies that have been done in this, in this time period uh, on behavior problems. And those 45 studies use 61 instruments. So there are a lot of instruments and there is not yet any standard operating procedure on how to do. And that's what is currently lacking because we need good diagnosis making. For instance, in the next slide, you can see that there was a study of a group uh, using the CBCL and the SDQ. These are standard questionnaires that can be used, but they found, they found in this study no ADHD comorbidity was found. And Probably that has to do because of the questionnaires that were being used, because uh, as patients with DMD cannot display the same type of hyperactive symptoms, such as fidgetness, it may be that they will not be detected by the instruments being used. So we need instruments that can be used and that are specifically designed for Duchenne patients. And currently there is a lot of work being paid on this, uh, on this topic. 
the next slide is then to shortly discuss brain involvement with you. And uh, you can see in the next slide that uh, Duchenne de Boulogne already wrote in 1868, 86, I'm sorry, that he described 13 patients and he already described more than a century ago that six of them had low intelligence and that two of them had language problems and that two of them had epilepsy. So brain involvement was already uh, described by the original description uh, in French, for instance, in the next slide, we found, uh, uh, and you can press another time, uh, Su Susie Anne, to show it in uh, English, that uh, what Duchenne de Bologna himself wrote about intelligence and about his interest in letters and the passion, a violent passion about coins. So these are all elements that we uh, recognize today, uh, comparing with reading problems and uh, uh, autism spectrum problem and other problems that might be uh, uh, play a role. So the next slide then is about the brain involvement. Several studies have now been published showing that in the brain there are no muscles but there is dystrophin and in the next slide there was a study published, uh, one of, uh, it's the study of the ENMC workshop which was published in 2020 uh, on uh, brain involvement and, and the role of brain dystrophy in, in muscular dystrophy. When you want an update on this issue, we can refer to this publication because uh, all the experts uh, were uh, collected in this workshop and wrote down uh, what it is uh, uh, about in, in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Well, the issue I want to discuss is the Big Ten and that is in the next slide because from clinical perspective, uh, there, uh, we have developed a theory of 10 issues, 10 the problem, problem areas, attention areas that need attention. It's like a heuristic framework to think about what should we consider about the psychological aspects of Duchenne. And in the next slide, you see the 10 areas, um, the 10 uh, circles describing the 10 domains of uh, issues and there are uh, four greater areas for instance the area of automatization working memory and attention which has to do with cognition you can press once uh, Susie in and, and then the other areas about dyslexia and dyscalculia which has to do with learning if you press again it's that the third domain is about uh, feelings, anxiety and depression, which has to do with emotion. And the fourth area has to do with what behavior with attention deficit or autism and obsessive compulsive behavior. And this looks very uh, easy to understand. But when you look at the reality, we find that this picture is a little bit more complex. And you can see this in the next slide where you see that often in clinical practice, there is a complex overlap with partly hidden areas, seemingly minor problems or uh, other problems that are overshadowed by other issues. So we should remember that when we talk about uh, psychology, isolated problems are rare and that we often have a mix of problems and that it may be very different for each boy. Um, the I go now to the third uh, topic of my of my talk, and it's about psychosocial adjustment. And that has to do with perception. And you can see that in the next slide. So it is a, this is about psychology. It is the way you perceive the things, the issues uh, where you are confronted with. And for Duchenne, in the next slide, we know that the first wheelchair may be a relief or maybe a loss of function. And we know that that may be uh, uh, different and may influence behavior different and may result in different adjustment and ways of dealing with uh, with the issues uh, concerned with, uh, with Duchenne. Um, and in the next slide, there is an overview of the losses with which boys with Duchenne and their families have to cope, getting up on their own power, walking alone, voluntary arm function and breathing. And this coping with loss has to do and results and may be 
uh, uh, associated with daily hassles that are in the next slide and that are all part of uh, dealing and adjusting to uh, uh, Duchenne. So dealing with fatigue, with uh, endurance of activity over bodily pain, but also with psychological tasks, just as they have to learn to ask for help or they have to learn to wait for help be before they are uh, helped. And uh, in the next slide, we describe a question. We describe a questionnaire that aims to help assessing psychosocial in males with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We published a study. It was in 2008 already, and we studied. We used this questionnaire in 322 men, and we found out that this PARS, which is an easy to administer questionnaire, may be uh, easily used for screening for boys at risk and it is now also widely used as a reported outcome measure and actually this questionnaire has been translated now in uh, a lot of languages as I know uh, uh, also by the World Duchenne Organization so that is easily accessible to measure six aspects of, of adjustment that I have summarized in the next slide uh, and uh, we know that these are the main issues you can consider when uh, adjust when when you want to know a little bit out about how how people suggest to the uh, Duchenne associated problems uh, how do they deal uh, are there social relationship dependency hostility which is a very important way of dealing with stresses but also anxiety and depression and in the next slide, you see the 28 questions. Don't, uh, you can just have a quick look at it. And if you are interested in this questionnaire, please contact me because I can find out whether it has been translated in the language you use. And we know now how it works and how it should be used to detect boys who are at risk. When you look at the next slide, you can see that for adjustment scores that as boys, we know now from the research that as boys grow older, they grow into a better adjustment. And when you push the button once, Susie Ann, you can see that there is a period when, uh, um, uh, when there is highest, lowest adjustment scores. And when we see that boys start to uh, um, uh, um, uh, get the handicap uh, in a place in the uh, living, we know that, and that the age of 8 to 11 may be a period when they have most problems in adjusting to the issues concerned with Duchenne. There is also an adult questionnaire. This is on the next slide. This was published in 20, 2022, uh, where we found out that this questionnaire can also be used in adult patients and this is actually something which is growingly important that we know and that we should also assess these issues in adult patients. You can uh, go to the next slide then Susie M and to finalize this issue of um, uh, psychosocial adjustment we think that it is important that we realize that learned helplessness may be a risk because boys with Duchenne go through a lot of trouble for something without achieving a tangible result. And for instance, intensive physiotherapy with long braces does not lead to improvement. And this may result in learned helplessness. If we do a lot of things and we do our best and it does not have a result, then we may become learned helplessness and then we may become de depressive or sad and don't have an active coping strategy. It is a normal mechanism, but we know that boys, as they grow older, should start to cope and adjust to this. The next slide is to quickly uh, present a few slides on the cognitive functioning. And the slide that is following is the study originally published by Cotton in 2001 on uh, a review of intelligence. It was about 32 studies. And it was, it is the, the most cited study and it was all studies till 1999. In the next slide, we show that we did recently publish a study on all studies that have been published till 2022 using only the Wexler scales. 
So we wanted to check whether in 2022, the data from 2001 still uh, apply. And in the next slide, you can see that the distribution of intelligence, this is what we know. The Cotton study found an average IQ of 80.2. And in the study we published recently by Weerkamp, the mean average IQ was 84.8, which is four points higher. Uh, and that has to do with the instruments that have been used. But uh, this is what we now know and which is now uh, often validated and a, a, a very uh, solid result. And you also see that when you look at Becker, because we also reviewed those patients, you see that those intelligence quotient are a little higher and also a little bit below the average of 100. Okay, the next slide then is that we believe that general intelligence should be reconsidered and that neuropsychological testing is needed, uh, uh, assessing strengths and deficits. And in the next slides, you see one of the strengths of the boys. They have strong visual motor performance despite the motor handicap their visual motor performance is strong and we know that their visual thinking is a strong uh, cognitive function a more uh, 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 weakness in the cognitive function is on the next slide and has to do with working memory we know that uh, the brain has to efficiently store and retrieve information and working memory is as you remember one of the uh, items of the big ten and we know from parents that, and we know from research that this may be an issue, that they have difficulty to remember multiple instructions. Um, I think we should now skip a few slides, uh, Susie, and we go to slide 45. This we can skip this also, and the next also, this also. And then this is an important issue I want to make here when we talk about cognition is that what we often hear is that teachers complain that the boys are not motivated. Uh, well, the f in fact, they are not able to quickly switch their attention and go on with the next task. So attention is also a problem. And this was also an area of the Big Ten. Another area is on the next slide, and it has to do with learning to read. And you see a, a text which is very difficult to read. Probably you cannot read it because reading has to do not only with language, but with automatization. And we know, and you can skip two slides now, Susie Ann, that boys with Duchenne have a higher risk of dyslexia. And that they may also have difficulty in quickly naming numbers because they have difficulty with the automatization which is also once again one of the areas of the big ten so the next slide is then the lessons to learn we know that there is a disharmonic profiles of strengths and weaknesses and that neuropsychological examination is necessary and that we should consider emotion and cognition which go together and may mask each other. Psychoeducation is very important and remember the big ten of Duchenne. And then I quickly discuss shortly with you some of the neuropsychiatric comorbidity which on the next slide may be overshadowed by the presence of an illness. So uh, uh, neuropsychiatric comorbidity was not of interest until 10 years ago or something, because uh, the interest was focused on the uh, physical aspects. And we now know that there are also uh, issues that are overshadowed and should be looked after because they are important. And those are the issues of learning and of behavior. And the next slide is a study about acquired ADHD in Duchenne is overshadowed by muscle problems. It's a study which we published and which uh, uh, stresses that it is important to uh, pay attention to those neuropsychiatric issues. And in the next slides, you can see the incidences that have been reported in a recent, very recent meta-analysis to 2020, 2022, showing in the, in the second column, the number of studies that have been done 
and also in the third column, the mean average, the mean prevalence in Duchenne with between the braces, the variation of the different standards. And you can see there, it's a lot of variation in the prevalences of all these issues, uh, reflecting that it is very urgent that there is a standard operating procedure of assessing. And in the last column, you see the prevalence of the uh, in, uh, issues in normal population. I think we should go on to, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I want to end my uh, presentation here and give the, the floor to Professor, to Dr. Colin. Um, I'm indeed the last speaker of this conference and the last speaker of today. So I will hope to keep your attention for a couple of 10, 15 minutes uh, to my talk. Um, we will talk about treatment options in uh, neuropsychiatric comorbidity and uh, treatment options in uh, psychopathology. And we always say there is not so many literature. On the other hand, I will show you uh, in this talk uh, a couple of an overview of some articles who are published. And important also um, our own results, our own data, uh, uh, who uh, has recently uh, been uh, accepted uh, this week uh, for uh, publication. So we are get very glad about that. Um, I, I will talk about uh, mostly psychopharmacology treatment, uh, but on the other hand, it's important to know that if we see a child with Duchenne and we diagnosed uh, the, the boy with uh, some kind of psychopathology, we always start with psych psychoeducation, um, teaching about what is the pathology, uh, how can the child understand his own uh, um, ADHD or autism disorder, and, and talk about parents. Um, when we look to literature, we don't have uh, no scientific reports on psychotherapy. Uh, the problem often is with that regular mental health care, also in the Netherlands, is not accessible for children with Duchenne. Uh, they come mostly to our center uh, that's in the south of the Netherlands. And that means that a lot of children has to travel a lot and it, 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 it's difficult to, to, to help and, and, and and to be there for parents because there's a long distance. And, and we try to, to give advice to other regular mental health care um, and, and like we work together. Um, what I say, I was talking about some few studies on psychopharmacology. The first study is uh, from uh, Brusa, um, where they did a, um, a scoping review was performed. Uh, and the aim of uh, was to summarize the current knowledge on the use of pharmacotherapy in the treatment of uh, mental disorders in patients with neuromuscular disorder. In those uh, articles, they have some other uh, neuromuscular disorder, uh, diseases, but uh, we will talk about the, the five studies in, in Duchenne. Um, psychiatric symptoms, they can be severe and psychopharmacological treatment may be, uh, in that case, often required. Uh, however, there is little known about pharmacotherapy in those conditions. And in this study, uh, of uh, when we look to the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there are five articles they reported on psychopharmacological psychopharmacological treatment um, on neurodevelopmental disorder, intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, tic disorder, and so on. Um, and two papers, there were case reports, two papers were case series, and one was an observational study with no control group. Out of the five, two of them were from our research group. Um, this is an article about, about methylphenidate use in uh, male with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and ADHD. And we see that 70% of the boys had a significant clinical improvement. And what, what was most important also, there were no big side effects. Before we start with treating with uh, uh, psychotropic drugs, we always discuss with neurologists and with the cardiologist um, if everything is safe. safe. Until now, we didn't see any uh, um, uh, serious side effects other than the side effects you can expect from a treatment with methylphenidate, like some uh, decrease of appetite and, and some uh, uh, um, sleeping disorders. 
Um, another study, because next to the ADHD, we often see uh, obsessive compulsive behavior, um, is um, a case study uh, we published uh, some years ago in 2016 about a boy uh, with uh, obsessive compulsive uh, behavior, and he had also a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, that was one of the first boys we treated with an SSRI, fluoxetine, uh, 20 milligram. And the most important thing is that till now, when we are seven years later, he is still doing very, very well. His twin brother, who has also Duchenne and obsessive compulsive behavior, was not reacting on a treatment of uh, fluoxetine. So that was, yeah, that was strange also. Um this is an article uh, about the obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there you see one on the seven uh, patient prevalence was 15%. In an earlier study of uh, Jos Hendricks, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder was around 5%. Also here you see a treatment with different SSRI, fluoxetine, sertraline, paroxetine, citalopram, and acetylopram. And 10 out of 15 had a clinical improvement on the CGI. Um, another recent, uh, recent or an, an article published in 2019 uh, was a retrospective case series study with a lot of patients, but it was retro retrospective when they looked to uh, 700 uh, DMD patients between 2012 and 2018. And then they were finding 38% emotional and behavioral dysregulation, 31% ADHD, it's a big uh, amount of uh, uh, problems in, in DMD patients, 25% OCD, uh, uh, and also around 25 language and speech delays. And out of this group, 25% required pharmacological intervention. And in those uh, overview, fluoxetine was the main pharmacological intervention. So what I talk about, what's the place of medication? Uh, what I said before, you have diagnosis, psychoeducation, parent coaching, school consultation, behavioral therapy sometimes, and then psychopharmaca. Um, when we look to our group, uh, we make a difference in, in six indications, what we find are um, reasons for giving medication. That's ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, autistic spectrum disorder, anxiety, mood disorder, and uh, what we call the rest group of intermittent explosive disorder. And in our uh, group, uh, we had an, uh, a group between, we described it between 2015 and, and 2021. Uh, there were seven uh, DMD boys with autism, uh, two with the combination of uh, autism and OCD, and two had uh, autism with behavioral problems. 15 patients with ADHD, seven who had ADHD and behavioral problems, five with OCD, three with anxiety disorder, and four who had a mood, uh, mood disorder with anxiety, and the other one with OCD complaints. Out of a total of 34 boys on medication, there were 28 boys on one medication. So I think that's a rather good result. That means that our diagnosis was rather correct and the treatment was follow on and they, we, we, we kept uh, treating them with, with one medication. Four boys had two different medications. Uh, that doesn't mean that it is at the same time that uh, we started with one and when it was not working, we changed to another one. Two boys had in this uh, series three different medication. And it was one boy, um, but there I think our diagnosis was not correct. There were a lot of problems between parent and child, and that was a problem and not not the psychopathology so we were treating psychopathology with different medication and nothing helped and because i think the problem was much more broader because it was a, a especially a problem between this boy his behavior and how his parents react on his behavior um then we look to the uh, type of medication we give and then you see methylphenidate Almost every uh, psychotropic drugs we have in child psychiatry, methylphenidate, dexamphetamine, clonidina, atomoxetina, also for ADHD, dipiperone, risperidone, citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetina, amitriptyline. There was one boy on amitriptyline, but that was the anesthesiolog anesthesiologist who gave it for pain uh, uh, symptoms. 
and we um, we increase the dose uh, for a um, um, mood disorder. Alprazolam and oxazepam, and I will talk a little bit about later about those two uh, benzodiazepines. Um, then when you look to the effect, 19 of them had a significant positive effect on the CGI, 12% of the mild effect, Thir in 13 times there was no effect and three were much worse. Then when you compare the significant positive effects and you look to what kind of medication has a result, and we can say at this moment that methylphenidate for the ADHD, because we see often ADHD problems in young and boys with uh, DMD, then you see that methylphenidate has a good result. Also, uh, earlier uh, article uh, showed that result, and we have in our group of, of patients which we are following now have the same result that methylphenidate has a significant positive effect. 10 of 22, that means that the other one had uh, also a positive effect, but it's CGI, it's one and not a two. So it's all, it's all, it's, it's a change, but not a very, very big change, but there is, anyway, there is a change. We have amitriptyline, fluoxetine, and we had no very good result on resperidone, and we had four, um, and that were um, uh, what older and adults uh, we treated with uh, uh, alprazolam and oxazepam. Um, now, what you see, and uh, Jos was already talking about the heterogeneity of behavioral and emotional fundings, findings, the use of pharmacotherapy is yeah not been well investigated i think our article what will be published and now in the coming uh, weeks uh, shows a, a a result of our um, group with with different medication and there you see a significant positive effect of methylphenidate on the uh, on treatment on adhd and fluoxetine on treatment on more um, obsessive compulsive behavior uh, and, and mood disorder. Um, there is no objection for a combination of steroids and, and psychopharmaca. Um, what I was talking, and we will publish also another article about anxiolyticals in adult patients with severe anxiety. And we can we 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 think this can be considered when there is when there is severe anxiety. It needs uh, very close monitoring huh, when you talk with people with with um, with um, ventilation and and. And, and breathing disorder, and um, then you have to be very careful. But um, we 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 were close monitoring, and we see uh, a, a very positive effect uh, on 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 young men with with um, severe mood disorder and severe anxiety. Um, what we discussed already, and you say that uh, uh, next to the, the the problems with the Duchenne and the, and the muscular problems, parents worry uh, more and more about the behavior of their child. Um, good diagnostic tools are lacking. That's important. Um, psychotropic drug can be an important option. Um, and I hope I show some results who can help you to, uh, to treat also own patients with uh, this kind of medication. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for these wonderful uh, presentations. And I know that everybody is waiting for more on information on this subject. And um, we can't say often enough that you really paved the way for a lot of families and other clinicians to improve this kind of treatments and observations and screening. So both, thank you so much. And then we see that you have the most questions. <laughs> if you click on the V and A, do you see it in your screen, V and A? You, you see the questions. And I think best is to make uh, your own selection. I see one person is asking a lot of questions. So maybe you can pick one of that person and maybe some others uh, as well. But uh, you, there is time for questions. So uh, go for it, I would say. Yeah, there was one one question. Can spinal fusion surgery uh, and anesthesia cause imbalance in neurotransmitters and trigger anxiety? Um, yeah, what we know is that uh, um, that hospitalization and 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 all all everything what what's uh, 
um, concerning this 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 problem around when a Duchenne boy get hospitalized, um, then it triggers a lot of anxiety that has not really to do with neurotransmitter. I think it's all the aspect of the hospitalization. Um, it, uh, yeah, if if you look to anesthesia, then we have to compare with with other children uh, without Duchenne in, in in neuropsychiatric disorder. I, I'm I'm. I, I don't know any results if if anesthesia cause imbalance in neurotransmitter and maybe you can think but I, but I don't know how how it works in general psychiatry if there is a problem between anesthesia and neurotransmitter so we we don't know about Duchenne boys but we know that hospitalization uh, and 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 somatic problems can can cause a lot of uh, uh, trigger anxiety. I, there is also a question about cognition. Can cognition progress in young adults through their, though there is not learning disability from childhood? We know that cognition is uh, uh, progressing and developing as expected. So there is no deterioration or a decline in intelligence over age. There is still some debate and research whether th this uh, for working memory, there are more working problems as they grow older, but until now, no studies have found that there is any progression in cognition. And we know that is that is independent from, from learning disability. So those are two different things. And that's why they are in the Big Ten also as, as different things. Uh, um. Somebody is asking, what's the incidence of schizophrenia or atypical psychosis in young adult DMD? Normal incidence in, in children is 1%. Um, in DMD, I don't know because I never saw a DMD boy with, uh, with, with, uh, with schizophrenia or even not with psychotic problems. I think with schizophrenia, it's, 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 it, I think it's ra rather very, very rare. Um, but in our group of children and young adults, we saw uh, with DMD, um, there were no uh, um, psychotic problems, even no atypical psychotic problems. So we didn't see them. And then there's the question from Kathy Turner about the uh, whether there are any studies on the uh, cost benefits to healthcare and social care of improved delivery of psychosocial care. I'm not aware of those studies. I don't think they have been done. All the interest has until now been done on uh, how to measure and assess psychosocial adjustment and eventual issues. So. Uh, I think that, as I understand from the UK, there is probably an ongoing research to find out how this uh, translates. So that is a good idea to find out what it, uh, what are the costs and the benefits. Um, there was also a question I see about pharmacogenomics test. Um, in general psychiatry, we do not standard pharmacogenomic test. We do only when treatment is not uh, working or when we see that the first or the second psychotropic drug um, it's not working, or you see a lot of uh, um, side effects, and then we do a, a pharmacogenetic test. In our group of Duchenne boys, we didn't, because most of them uh, we treated with one or two uh, psychotropic drugs. So I think there was no clear indication uh, to do a pharmacogenomic test, but maybe later on uh, when, when we see that some boys are, are we have to treat with different medication i think it's 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 certainly um uh, effective uh, but uh, it's not standard of cure um, when you only treat a patient with with one uh, psychotropic drugs yeah. and even not when it's working so there is no indication then And then there's a question about when you have limited resources what to do with the assessment um, and it is it is said that probably the age of eight to ten might be an, a good age to do. Then, yeah, I think that we we know that uh, at the age of eight we are able to have good reliable intelligence testing, and you are able to do a good neuropsychological investigation. Uh, in the Netherlands, we advise to have an investigation at four, at twelve, and at sixteen. So three moments. Uh, but if you don't have the, and, and if necessary, it can be done earlier when the boys grow into a problem. But if you have limited resources, I think 
that's a good suggestion, eight to 10 years. And again, you can use the big 10 to screen for problems even at earlier age. So if you are aware of those problems, you can find, try to find it out. And at the moment we are trying with a, a European study on the BIND brain involvement together with, uh, with, with the World Duchenne Organization to make a questionnaire, a simple questionnaire to screen the boys who are at risk for problems in uh, behavior and learning. So probably within the next year, there will be an instrument available for parent platforms, patient platforms to try to screen for problems for boys who are at risk. Um, another question, are there any studies on the effect of benzodiazepines on patients with DMD? The answer is no, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I am not known about any study. Um, we have those, those four uh, boys and, and I think we, we have the intention to, to, to make a publication, but it's not yet published. Um, at the beginning, we, we discussed a lot with uh, um, uh, other doctors before we started benzodiazepine, and we also uh, ask advice to uh, the, 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 the colleagues who are working on the ICU, because they, they use benzodiazepine with, with patients on weaning when they are severe uh, anxiety, and, and, and then they use benzodiazepine. So that, that's the reason why we, why we, why we said we, maybe we can start on a close monitoring um but uh, yeah there there are no studies at all no, no. there's a there's a question on the training of working memory i, I skipped that uh, slide i had a slide prepared but uh, i i don't didn't want to overwhelm you with all the information but there are now studies done and we did a study where we trained four boys with Duchenne with working problems with a computer-based program, and they trained six weeks, uh, five days a week uh, for working memory. And we found that there was an effect that even lasted six months after the training. Um, as far as I know, that's the first study that has been done in training working memory, and more work is needed. But we are sure that you can train working memory or that you can find out ways to uh, compensate or to find ways that they don't have so much problems from their working memory problems. How does lack, lack of dystrophin affect the brain functioning? That's a good question because that was one of the questions of our BIND study, uh, brain involvement in, in, uh, in, uh, in neuromuscular disorders. Um, because there, there is dystrophin in our brain, but and and we think maybe it will it will probably affect, uh, uh, but we don't know at this moment what uh, what what was really affect. And because what you see in psychopathology, um, it's the same psychopathology we see in children without DMD, and we and and now we are discussing have there more psychopathology? Is it different than other people in child psychiatry? And I think that 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 raises a lot of question that will maybe be answered in the coming years. Is there a is there a document about the Big Ten? Uh, no, there is not yet a document about the Big Ten. But uh, Duchenne Parent Project in the Netherlands has made some uh, funding for a time to write this down and to make a document. And we hope that this will be. Uh, this, this this will be ready in the next year and then we hope that it will be available and translated into other languages. There is the study of the ENMC workshop from 2020 where it is shortly described. It was a neuromuscular disorders, but uh, a document with describing the big time in detail is not yet available. And I think we this, although there are still six questions open, we might round off a little bit. It's almost um, six o'clock. We promised people the meeting would be till uh, six. So then as a, as a wrap up, we had an amazing afternoon. I think it was the newborn screening session was fantastic. The emergency session was fantastic. This is something uh, people are really waiting for since a long time. And also a lot of clinicians are not so much aware of but what is going on in it neurology, uh, neuropsychology and uh, psychiatry. So we are amazing uh, that you can do this today and the other speakers as well. I hope some of them are still 
uh, online. And if not, we will thank them again. We thank all the people who attended these two days and we hope you will spread the message to your countryman, to your colleagues. So more and more people will learn about all these problems and new insights in uh, Duchenne and not only problems, but also solutions. So Suzanne is always the last one to say something. Maybe you want to say something about how we will disseminate this information to the attendees, right? So I stop here and the word is to, last word is to Suzanne. <laughs>